Well, hello again, my friends. I am glad to be back with you as we continue our class, Presbyterian 101. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the doctrine of the church, uh, known as ecclesiology. Uh, but before we get into that, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you that uh, despite the fact, God, that, that we are sinful people, yet you love us. You love us uh, with a love that cannot be taken away. You love us with a love that nothing in heaven or on earth or anything can separate us from that love in Christ Jesus. And so I thank you, God, that you, uh, you come to seek and to save the lost and to indeed build your church um, from individuals that you redeem. And so today I pray you open our eyes that we might understand more fully uh, who it is that you are and the things that you are doing in this world. And we pray this in Christ's precious and powerful name. Amen. Last time we got together, we discussed the nature of civil and political authority, political government, paying particular attention to Romans chapter 13 and chapter 23 from our confession. Today we'll look a bit at Westminster chapter 25, which covers the doctrine of the church. And we'll also look at some, uh, some ideas through the scriptures, um, which I hope will help to kind of enlarge our perspective a bit more. More thoroughly. Um, let's open now with Westminster chapter, or Confession of Faith, chapter 23, uh, points 1 and 2. The Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ the head and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Point two, the visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined to one nation as before under the law, consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children, and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Now, Christians for millennia have confessed the Apostles and the Nicene Creed, each of which proclaim, among various other doctrinal essentials, that I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. For Protestants or Catholics who may not be aware of maybe the historical development of the church, it may be startling to hear Protestants proclaim their faith in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, but Protestants should not balk at the term Catholic for one moment. When we proclaim our belief in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we are correctly affirming the fact that there is is one established church that was founded by Christ Jesus upon the earth, and that this one church confesses him as Lord, the only begotten Son of the Father, as our confession says, who came for the redemption of God's people, as foretold in the scriptures. The, the Catholic Church is, to say, the universal church, the one global church of Jesus Christ, which includes all saints also in history, going back even unto the time of Adam. It is all, and likewise, not merely those in the past, but also all of those who are in Christ and alive today. You may hear folks speak of the church in various ways. Um, one way of speaking of the church that is presently alive is to speak of the church militant. That is, those who are yet in the process of striving for faithfulness in the midst of the world of sin, who are striving uh, to be, live in obedience to God and to proclaim the gospel, that we, those who are yet alive, um, who have not been freed from sin and this body of death, we are part of this church militant. 
On the other hand, you may speak of the church triumphant, and the church triumphant refers to all those who have died and now are in the presence of the Lord in glory, uh, awaiting the resurrection. That would be the church triumphant, the church, those who have already overcome the world and the ways of this world, who are now in the presence of the Lord Jesus. But in all cases, whether we're referring to the Christians who are alive now, or those that are the Christians who are have died and are with the Lord, we are all part of the one Catholic Church. Now, there are, of course, various denominations um, which may have differences on particular doctrinal issues, but nonetheless, when we speak of the Church, capital C, we are speaking in the broadest possible terms. All people in all places that are in relationship with God through Christ. It's worth noting that the scriptures speak of the, excuse me, that this, when the scriptures speak of the church, that they may, the, the scriptures may use the term church to refer in some sense to maybe different uh, aspects of the church as a whole. So on the one hand, you have the ways in which the scripture speaks of the church as I am now, which is to refer to all believers in all places, the church writ large. When we think of the church in those terms, uh, the church is being contrasted in particular to the world. You have the church and you have the world. So you think of these and these are sort of the broadest kind of designations. So when Paul, uh, uh, excuse me, so yeah, so for example, now we, we also have the idea of, of uh, when we are referring to a particular gathered body of believers who gather for Sunday worship as a different kind of a way of speaking of the church. So when Paul talks about the church at Corinth and describes the unique activities of those who do gather, who celebrate communion together, and Paul describes the way in which we are to conduct Sabbath worship, he is referring to the church in this way as the kind of the assembly of God's people and perhaps a particular local assembly of God's people. When we speak of the church in this way, we are distinguishing between what Christians do when they gather corporately together in a particular community as opposed to perhaps what an individual Christian may do uh, outside of the gathered body, in the world, in work, or at home. Right? I am a member of the church as a whole, and as a result, the things that I am doing are connected always to the church. Um, I am a member specifically of Coral Ridge. Um, what I do as a husband, or again, within uh, the world, this is me being a, a manifestation of the church, but what I do individually is not an act of the church as a whole in terms of kind of a gathered body of worship. Finally, the Bible also speaks of the church in terms of a government, right? Where we, we are contrasting here the governing structures of the world versus the government of the church, which has particular leaders, particular elders, individuals who have been recognized and called to leadership and have been appointed by a particular group of people. Um, and these local leaders are responsible for a particular particular body of believers that are members of the community that they are part of. When we talk of church discipline, for example, um, if we correct an individual who has sinned, if we rebuke them, tell them, hey, this is something that you have done against me. If they fail to repent, Jesus tells them, now tell that to the church. 
And what Jesus is referring to there is not the church as a whole. It wouldn't make sense for if there's an issue that you have with someone who is a part of Coral Ridge, it doesn't make sense for us to go to another church and to tell them about that. Rather, this is speaking of bringing that issue to the attention of local leaders, recognizing that the leadership of a local church is an aspect of the government that Christ Jesus has established in its particular uh, kind of regional form, so Coral Ridge or any other number of, of, of churches in various other regions. As we spoke previously, the the civil government has particular responsibilities that God has given to the civil government, and God has also equipped civil government with particular uh, uh, authority to carry out those responsibilities. The church likewise has particular responsibilities, and God has also given the authority to pursue those responsibilities well. So the church has the authority to declare to a repentant sinner, your sins are forgiven. And on the other hand, for someone who in the context of church discipline refuses to repent, refuses to acknowledge what they have done, the church has the authority to retain that sin and to say your sins are not forgiven, which is what occurs in the act of excommunication as an example. In any case, as we read the scriptures, it's important for us to recognize the ways in which certain words may be used to refer to different aspects uh, of the same kind of a doctrine, so in this case the church, where in each context it may not be referring to the same identical thing. We have the church as a whole, we have the church as the gathered community of worshiping believers on Sunday, and we have the church referring to the specific government uh, that is manifest in any number of local contexts as well. And so we we need to recognize the context that we are speaking of. Now, For the purpose of our conversation today, Reformed theology, and we see this within our confession, places particular emphasis when we discuss our understanding the church on distinguishing between two realities that are present in the lives of, or in in every specific church. When we consider the church as a whole, We recognize that there are individuals who may attend church, who may have some relationship to a local congregation, but who do not have a relationship with God as such. Many will point to parables of Jesus to establish this point, where Christ, for example, discusses the kingdom of God as being a field in which the master plants, you know, uh, sows various seeds, and those seeds come up as healthy wheat. But then on the other hand, it describes that the enemy of the, the owner of the field comes in to scatter weeds throughout that uh, wheat field. And so Jesus, speaks of those that are genuine believers as being the wheat, whereas there are those who maybe are part of the community but are in fact weeds. Jesus speaks of those on the day of judgment who will say, Lord, Lord, to him, but he will respond, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. In the context of Jesus' own day, which we, of course, don't want to neglect, as I was just saying, sometimes passages in their own context refer to something very specific, and we need to be very careful not to just lift that out of context in order to make some kind of an application to our own selves. We need to understand the scripture contextually. In the context of his own day, we can see quite clearly that the, the priests, the scribes, 
scribes and the Pharisees who reject Jesus are those who are sowing weeds, that they are those that, that come forth and they teach false things, which, te- which lead their disciples to not be followers of God, but as Jesus says, you make your disciples to be twice a son of hell, as they in fact are. Um, these individuals, the Pharisees of course, believe themselves to be utterly righteous and faithful people. Um, However, Jesus is quite clear about those, that those who reject Jesus are those who in fact are also rejecting the one who sent him. To reject Jesus is to reject the Father, no matter how those individuals may have believed themselves to be the true bearers of righteousness. In fact, they were workers of lawlessness who directly reject the God uh, and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ in rejecting Jesus himself. When Jesus is talking about those in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, that those who hear his words and act upon them and seek to obey them, he talks about them as being those who have built their house upon a firm foundation, a rock foundation, that when the storm comes, it will not be destroyed. But those that reject him are those who build their house upon the sand. In this context, Jesus isn't speaking of any random house. He's not speaking generally. He's speaking in terms of the biblical language about the temple itself, which is God's house, which is the house for God's name, as the scripture says. Those who were in charge of that house had rejected Christ Jesus, and under their leadership, God's house becomes, as Jesus says, a den of robbers, as opposed to being a house of prayer for all nations. Again, we have to be careful to pay attention to the immediate context before we rush to apply those words to ourselves. We can make application to ourselves, uh, but the way that we do that well is by recognizing the first context. Now, we also from this can derive a principle, however, which is that it is clear that there are individuals who may be a part of the church, who may have come in, and who yet does not actually know Jesus. Judas was a thief and a liar from the beginning, the scriptures tell us. While attracted to Jesus or to the things that Jesus was doing or providing in some way, Judas was not a genuine follower of Christ Jesus. Now, every week, thankfully, as we gather for Sunday worship, We are confronted by the scriptures. God himself confronts us. And we know that God is seeking to save the lost. He's not seeking out those who are well. He is seeking out those who are sick. And he is uniquely capable of breaking through hard hearts. Nevertheless, it is clear that there are those who are raised in the church or at some point have become part of the church who ultimately reject Jesus. In the recognition of this reality, the confession speaks of the invisible church and the visible church. The visible, in, the visible church includes all people who have professed faith. They are all the people who are a part of the visible body of Christ. Uh, in, in, it is visible in this sense in that we can see it, right? If, if we really wanted to, it would be possible for us to gather every living member of the body of Christ into one place, right? We could fit everybody, all two and a half billion. We could fit everybody in one small corner of Texas, if that's where we decided to gather. And it would be hypothetically possible that we could even throw up a drone and take a picture of the whole lot, every individual who has become a member of a church, who is a regular attender of a church, and all of their children. This is the visible church. Among us would be included those who have genuine faith and those who perhaps do not have genuine faith. This is a mixed body of both true believers and those who are not yet true believers, or who are not true believers, but who maybe have professed faith or something else. 
The invisible church, however, is the term that is used uh, to refer specifically to those who are actually the elect. If you recall from a previous class in this Presbyterian 101 series, we talked about the sovereignty of God and the doctrine of election, that it is God who is saving us according to his sovereign choice by his grace. And there, there are those whom God has determined before the foundation of the world that they would be holy and blameless in the sight of God. As it says here, the Catholic or universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the, the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ the head and is the spouse, the body, and the fullness of him, Christ, that fills all all in all. When we speak of the invisible church, we are uh, attempting to hone in on the, the, the actual number of individuals who on the last day will be vindicated. All those who on the last day facing the judgment will be declared righteous, vindicated, members of the church in Christ Jesus. It is all those who are elect, right? It is all those to whom Christ will say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. Now, I think it's important to say that in this sense, the concept of the invisible church is, is maybe conceptually useful because it helps us to distinguish between various things. But practically speaking, I'm not convinced it is a particularly useful thing for each of us because we do not have the ability to look into the hearts of individuals and to determine with true accuracy um, whether or not they are one of the elect. This is not something that God has given to us at all to know. The secret things of God are just that. They are the secret things of God, and we do not have a perfect grasp of the mind of God. We do not have a perfect grasp of the way in which he is working in the hearts of individuals um, throughout this globe. And of course, we could not possibly know any of that. But more than that, we're not supposed to know these kinds of things. It's not for us to know these kinds of things. And so I think at some level, um, this notion of the invisible church, while maybe a helpful category to consider in terms of a systematic theology, practically speaking, it is very difficult for us to do anything whatsoever about that because what we've got is the visible church. I'm able to see the actual people who gather at Coral Ridge. I'm able to actually have relationship with the people that I'm seeing at church, and I don't have the capacity to, to, to ultimately go into their hearts in that particular way. And so what I'm not interested in doing in any way is encouraging you or anyone else to some kind of unfruitful sort of navel gazing, constantly questioning whether or not you're really, really, really saved or that you're, whether or not you're really, really, really elect. This is unfortunately something that has been a consequence of Reformed theology, but I believe that it is not something um, which should bog us down whatsoever. The danger, I think, is, is when we confess that salvation is by grace alone and it is by faith alone in Christ Jesus to then find ourselves constantly turning inward to ask, well, I believe, but do I really, really believe, right? Do I believe enough? I have faith, but do I have enough faith, right? Is it enough? Uh, I think among certain Puritan churches um, in New England in the 1600s, you see this kind of uh, unhelpful navel gazing, I think, uh, manifest in a particular way where they, they even instituted stages of membership. Right? If, there, if you hadn't had any particular earth-shattering conversion experience, then you actually were not allowed to become a full member in certain churches during this period. You could become a halfway member. They talked about it as being a halfway covenant. 
But in order to become a full member and in order to have your children baptized, they required that you were able to bring significant evidence of a personal conversion experience. And without that, you wouldn't be a member. I think this is just clearly, this practice is a mistake. We are not supposed to be, um, you know, we're not supposed to throw up massive barriers to individuals seeking to become part of the church. Again, we are not able to perfectly determine if an individual's profession is absolutely genuine or if that is something that will persist. Jesus speaks of those who for a time may embrace the, the word of the gospel, may somehow come into the church, but if that word if that seed is not planted in, in fertile soil, many, they, they end up falling away. We see people who talks about how it grows up very briefly, but then it's choked out by thorns or whatever else, or the roots are not deep, and so the sun scorches it, and it ultimately destroys that plant as well. And so again, it's not for us to determine who those people are. It is not for us to do that, but God has called us to be the church who proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ and who welcome all with open arms who affirmatively respond to the gospel. Every individual who professes faith in Christ Jesus and proclaims him as Lord is to be admitted to the church by baptism and to be admitted to the Lord's table for nourishment. And likewise, to acknowledge their children as members of the covenant as well. Right? We, I don't think that it is appropriate for us to, or even reasonable for us, to expect that every individual is going to have the same kind of experience. Right? And we cannot demand that everyone has the same kind of experience. Right? I can point to a very specific day where I had become a Christian. I can point to a moment when I became a Christian. It was a very powerful experience by all means, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. On the other hand, my wife would not be able to tell you a day that she did not know and love Jesus, right? She was raised in a Christian home. Her dad is a pastor. She's attended church from childhood on. She grew up reading the scriptures, being taught to pray. And in her experience, there was never a moment that she did not believe. And it, it, would, be, uh, it would be wicked and, and utterly misguided for someone to look at her and to say that if her experience didn't match mine, that therefore she couldn't possibly be a believer. Because again, what makes an individual a believer is not a particular kind of experience that they may have, but rather are they those who trust in Christ Jesus. Right? Her experience is not invalid merely because it didn't include some earth-shattering turn from sin or some kind of dumbstruck realization that Jesus is the Christ. If the kingdom belongs to children, as Jesus says, and that children, the belief of children, is the model of what true discipleship looks like, then we should, of course, not imagine then that Christ is not saving people even from childhood uh, and that they are remaining in the faith that they have always known. Right? We know that children are able to respond to their parents in love, even if they're not able to articulate that. And that is certainly also the case, that if God approaches our children, uh, he is able to cause them likewise to respond appropriately, whether they're able to explain it or not. If a child can have a relationship with a parent, then a child can have a relationship with God. And so we should not create some mark of membership or some mark of conversion that God himself has not absolutely given to us, right? We should listen to Christ Jesus on this point. 
Now, it is clear that anyone who has a relationship with Christ Jesus is bound to sin. All Christians are not perfect people. We are not those who have perfectly experienced sanctification, and we are not going to experience sanctification perfectly until we are fully removed from this body of death, which will only occur at our death. And so we must be careful as we consider these questions, that the, the presence of sin does not mean that an individual cannot be a believer, right? All of us may come into these periods of sin, right? But those that are in relationship with God are brought to repentance in the presence of their sin. It is not necessary if you sin to constantly go to the place where you're like, well, am I really a believer? Or does this sin demonstrate that I could possibly have never even believed in the first place? When we are faced with the reality of our own sinfulness, we should not despair that God would abandon us, but rather we must in every way seek to cast ourselves fully upon the mercy of God as we did on the day that we believed, as we do every moment that we are, we are falling into sin, right? Until we are raised from the dead, only then will, our, will, will we experience perfect freedom from our sinful nature. But until that time, we are those who will struggle with sin. But as those that struggle with sin, that does not mean we are not a part of God's family. It does not mean that we are not a part of God's holy bride. We are not saved according to the perfection of our obedience or even the perfection of our faith. We are redeemed by Jesus, who is the one in whom we trust. We are saved by Jesus, the one to whom we cling. And Christ Jesus does not let go of anyone who clings to him. You know, one of the things I think we sometimes forget is that when the Bible speaks of individuals as being blameless according to the law, those were not individuals who never sinned. Those that are blameless are not those who are perfect because no one from the dawn of time is perfect apart from Christ Jesus. No one in human history except Jesus himself is perfect. But those that are blameless according to the law are those who repented and who, uh, who listened to God's expectations for what to do when you sin. In the Old Covenant, we know that that would look like offering particular sacrifices on behalf of the sin or due to the sin that had been committed. In our context, that is coming to church. That is confessing your sins to the Lord. That is, again, trusting in Christ Jesus, being forthcoming with the realities in our lives, and hearing, again, the assurance of pardon that we experience every single Sunday, that your sins are forgiven. Remember, as we previously discussed in the topics of church government and the sacraments, the visible church has a genuine and actual authority. Right in this in our confession today it says the visible church which is also catholic or universal under the gospel not confined to one nation as before under the law it consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and their children and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ the house and family of God out of which, outside of which, there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Coming into the visible church, right? This is the ordinary location of salvation because the church that gathers as local bodies is the gathered body of the risen Christ. The visible church, the church is the ones to whom the Holy Spirit has been given. We are the temple of the living God. 
We are a nation of priests, as Peter says, living stones that are being built up into a new and holy temple, which Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We are the people who, in our gathered worship, experience the end of the world before the end. Think about this. We know that the destiny of all things is that every single knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth to Christ Jesus. Everyone on the last day will kneel before the Lord, whether as glorified believers in resurrected bodies or those who hated him all the way in their life. Every single knee is going to bow. And when we gather for Lord's Day worship, we actually are living out the way the world is supposed to be. We are living out the way the world will become even before everything is made finally new. In our services, human speech finds its truest purpose as the word of God, the promises of God are proclaimed by normal voices, normal men and women. Human speech finds its most glorified purpose as we raise our voices to sing, as we even give back the breath that God has given to us through a sacrifice of praise, glorified speech, showering him with, with praise. In our services, water is actually expresses its fullest and fundamental purpose as we baptize our children and as we receive new believers with water being made heavenly to become a vehicle of divine grace, sealing one's membership in the church. Right? Wheat and grapes, which are made to be bread and wine, find their highest calling in becoming bread and wine of the Lord's table, communicating the gospel of our salvation, which we can take and actually even eat, to taste and to see that the Lord is good. The church is the actual body of Christ Jesus, united to him by the power of the Holy Spirit, seated with him already in the heavenly places, Paul tells us, who are triumphant even in the midst of tribulation, who we are referred to as kings on the earth. We have become new Adams and new Eves who lived lives marked by faithfulness, who recognize that every aspect of their lives is the place where Christ Jesus is making us new, where every aspect of our lives is a place for worship. Whereas we live our lives, we do so as Christ Jesus did for the sake of the world, right? Because Jesus, of course, himself came for the sake of the world. And when God's people join for Lord's Day worship, those fallen sinners, sinners who have failed that week, come to hear the word proclaimed, right? Come to hear an assurance that in Christ Jesus, our redemption is sure. And by the power of the Spirit, even those words that are uttered through fallen and unclean lips, like that of Pastor Rob, are nonetheless the words that Christ Jesus Jesus himself is speaking to us, though he does so imperfectly, as all of us do. Yet nonetheless, the church is the actual body of Christ and is empowered to be just that. We bring all of our lives with us. All of our deeds from the previous week, every single experience that we've had, every moment of prayer and obedience, every good and difficult conversation, every sin and moment of faith, we bring them all every single week to meet the Lord. And every Lord's day, we are summoned by God. The heavenly Jerusalem gathers every single Sunday and the Lord makes covenant with us again and invites us again to, to eat and to taste and to see, to confess our sins and to be received, to recline at table 
in the kingdom with Christ Jesus as we drink the new wine of our salvation. And then God sends us back out into the world as a blessing, right? New people who have been made new and are every single week being made new by the power of the word. This is who we truly are, and this is what it is that we're doing. Right? We're not merely gathering on Sunday for kind of a nice thing that we like to do. Right? We actually step into the closest picture of the kingdom that we have here on the earth. It is the kingdom made visible, however imperfectly, as the Holy Spirit moves among us. Christ's genuine people, but genuine people who nonetheless are yet still sinful, right? As we meet with God, <clears throat> right, the, on Sundays, that is the fount of living water that enables us to go into the real world and to be different kinds of people, right? And again, we're not talking about, like, Jesus isn't trying to save us from a fake world. He's not trying to save us from some kind of Pollyanna perspective of the world. He's not saving us from a world that we're able to look through rose-colored glasses and to see, right? He is saving us from a real, dark, dangerous, difficult, and broken world. He's sending us into that very real, dark, dangerous, and broken world to actually be real light that meets the genuine darkness and overcomes it, right? The real darkness, the real problems in this world, not those easy, not the first world problems of which you and I often struggle against, but the real world. And it is as we are transformed in the gathered community Right? That is the way in which we become people who can live so that this world becomes a little bit more like heaven here on earth. When the Pharisees and the scribes accused Jesus of casting out demons with the power of demons, Jesus said that it is by the Spirit of God that he was doing this. And if it's by the finger of God that this happens, then the kingdom of God has come near. 1 John 3, 8 says, Whoever makes a practice of sin uh, is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. But the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And Jesus told his disciples, as the Father sent me, now I am sending you. The way that Jesus is extending his rule on the earth, the way that he is extending his reign to more people, to more places, is through his church, his body that he empowers to actually carry forth the very same mission that he himself was given by the Father to destroy all of the works of the devil. First, in our own lives, as we are those that are freed from the domain of darkness and are made to be members of his church, we undergo this process and we continually undergo this process of sanctification as the works of the devil, as the works of, and deeds of the flesh in our life are put to death, as we become those who, who learn to make habits of righteousness as opposed to continuing in habits of evil, we are experiencing the destruction of the devil's work in our our own lives. But as this occurs, the way that we live in the world fundamentally changes. The way that we interact with co-workers and friends and family and enemies change, right? And in this way, we are also sent out as those who were once rescued to now also assist in plundering the devil's kingdom. In calling those who do not yet know Christ, as we testify to what God has done in our hearts and in our lives, we bring others who do not know him to come and to meet their king. As we live sacrifices and a life of sacrificial love, even for our enemies, we show 
that there is a new way of living in the world, that we don't have to live according to the principalities and powers and demonic principles of this world any longer because there is a new king who has risen and who has indeed has all authority in heaven and on earth. Right, The kingdom which Christ established and which he is extending through the real daily lives of his people, the church. The fact that this is the case is, is the very reason that you're even here watching this video today. Right? It's because Jesus had actually established a visible church, a genuine church, which where it only numbered in, in the hundreds initially, they understood that because of what Christ has done, every aspect of their life was to be transformed. And they carried that message throughout the world. And they gathered together every single Sabbath, every single Sunday to be equipped again, to hear good news, to be reminded of the truth so that they could go forth again. And for two millennia, we have seen the gospel take this world by storm. And you and I are yet part of this. And so as we consider the church I, I do not, on the one hand, want you to hear this distinction between visible and invisible and to constantly then fear, well, am I truly elect? No, this is not useful. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling to make your calling and election sure. Everything uh, that we need has been given to us in Christ Jesus, and the only way of salvation is repentance and faith. That is true for every single individual. If you are in sin and caught in sin, then you need to come and you actually need to confess that sin and you need to seek help to overcome that sin. That's true of every single individual. Pursue the Lord Jesus. Do not sit in your anxiety and in your fear. No, hear the word of God that in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Do you trust that? Trust that, right? Jesus does not ever turn away anyone who says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? Those are the ones who Christ Jesus has justified and he promises he will never leave nor forsake. So I do not want you to live in this anxiety that is utterly unhelpful. But secondly, I don't want you to see the church as being something that is just an add-on to your life. Because it is not. There is only one real, true world. And we in the church actually experience that to the fullest extent. The church is the people in right relationship with God Almighty and who live according to those perspectives. And so when we gather as that body, we gather with the church triumphant. As Pastor Rob's been teaching through Revelation, we can see that, that the worship that we engage in on earth matches the worship that is going on in heaven just as well. We join the, the church triumphant as those who are yet still below. We join them in a chorus of praise and the Lord promises actually to be among us. And because of that, that means every single Sunday is a day of redemption. That every single Sunday is an opportunity to be renewed again and filled again with new water, new life that comes from the Lord and through his word. And so we are a, a humble people, but we also have a glory that goes beyond even our ability to fully understand. Our attendance is not, uh, is not something that should be neglected. We must gather in this place because the risen Jesus gathers with us. And so I pray in the midst of this that you can grasp at least a little bit more that the ways that, that God is working in our lives may appear to be these humble, common sorts of things. But in fact, there's a greater degree of glory. There's a greater degree of power that's present there, uh, even if it is not as flashy or as obvious as maybe worldly displays of power may be. But the Lord Jesus, the risen Jesus, is at work among us, his people, uh, and we invite you you, of course, come and be a part of it. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. All right, with that, um, let's finish with a word of prayer. God, I thank you um, 
that you've not left us as orphans, that though you've gone away, you've given us the Spirit, and, and the Spirit joins us together. He joins us to make us to be one family, to be one body, and he brings people that are not like us into relationship with us so that we might together learn to be more faithful people, that we might learn how to live as faithful witnesses in this world. So Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bless this, your church. I pray you would bless those that are listening to this today. I pray that you would bless the church in America and that, Lord, you would continue to equip your church across the globe. We are beset. We are assaulted on all sides. Many Christians are persecuted and even put to death. But Spirit, you are alive. Spirit, you are working in power among them, and I pray that you would do so. I pray, Lord, that you would put down your enemies, that you would cause them to see who you truly are, that you would cause them to submit, Lord, and to be redeemed unto you. Protect your servants, Lord Jesus, particularly those that face genuine tribulation. Protect them and empower them that they might hold the faith, that they might persevere unto the end, because we know that you promise that you'll raise them up on the last day. So God, give us confidence for that day. Help us to live lives that reflect it and bring good news to others. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.